Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. As you probably know, we are doing the series of Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first three months of 2013. And this series is entitled Origins. And as you could guess, it's a, it's a lesson about the understanding of what happened back when God created our world and all the implications that has throughout Scripture and throughout history. This is the final lesson in that series, lesson number 13 for March 30 of 2013. We would encourage you to get your Bibles and join us as we study together. As we do that, let's bow our heads as we have a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it's always a great privilege to gather in your name, to think about you, to study your word, and hopefully to become more like you. Forgive us for the ways we have misunderstood and perhaps not been careful enough in our study to understand what you want us to know. Now as we approach the final events in this earth's history and think about their, what they imply for our future, may we take them very seriously and become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In this lesson, we will discuss what needs to happen in order to eliminate sin and sinners and all traces of evil and create a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Does that sound like a pretty major task? Well, here is John's words to describe that in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Just like that. Does it talk about millions of years to create it? No, it doesn't. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared, and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be, he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. And that there will be no more death is a very important part of our understanding of living forever. There's a passage that also we probably should read, 2 Peter 3, starting with verse 10. It also adds some interesting parts to this story. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will disappear with the shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. I have a question. Yeah. The heavenly bodies will disappear. Does that mean the stars, the moon, the sun? I was about to ask that. And what about the earth? It sounds like the earth is going to be destroyed. Is God going to like start all over again? Well, it says, since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Are we supposed to have something to do with the destruction of this earth? I don't think that's exactly what he was implying. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. Does vanish mean destroyed? At least gone. Well, it doesn't mean destroyed. Well, if God sends it off somewhere where we can't find it, it could just as well be destroyed, right? Okay, well. These verses seem to suggest that the heavens and the earth will be destroyed and replaced. How complete will the destruction of our planet, or our earth be? At what point in history in the in the history of the final events, the second, third coming, will these new heavens and new earth be recreated? If the new Jerusalem is to come down and settle, because we have this scripture, if the new Jerusalem is to come down and settle on a plain created by the splitting of the Mount of Olives, does that seem that God has created a new earth? Zechariah 14, 4. Let's just look at that. Many people are not so not from... Hmm? Not yet. Not yet. At that time, he will stand on the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. Then the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west by a large valley. Half the mountain will move northwards and half up southwards. You will escape through that valley and so forth and so forth. And it talks about, elsewhere it talks about the, 
the New Jerusalem coming down and, and, and settling there. That kind of sounds like it's this earth, doesn't it? Or will God just make a new earth that uh, is just like this one, but has no sin and no evil and no trace of, of disease or death or anything like that in it? Well, it's described as, as the New Jerusalem riding on a lake of fire. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the earth is being sin and all that's associated with it being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And here's the New Jerusalem riding on top of that. And like the ark on the flood? Exactly. Okay. And out of that then comes a creation. Mm -hmm. And how that's going to happen is fun to speculate on. Well, uh, the, the, the suggestion, again, it, it, the Bible sort of implies this, but Ellen White says it very specifically, that the whole earth is going to be like the Garden of Eden. Doesn't God say that eye has not seen and ear has not heard? So it may even be a little bit different or and even that better power? than... Second Corinthians chapter 2. I wonder if there's a s deep symbolic aspect to this also, besides l trying to imagine it physically mm -hmm. like we're trying to do right now. Well... Of all the things that you can think about that, that you expect to experience in heaven, what do, you, what, what do you think is the best part? What do you look forward to the most? No more sin. Okay, that's, a, that's something missing. What, what I love dwelling with God. Dwelling with God? Dwelling with God? Uh, Being associated with yeah. God? Well, think of all the things that will be missing. There will be no death. No sin, no murder, no adultery, no lying, no stealing, no deceit, no selfishness. Can right. you even imagine a world without those things? Cry me a river, man. <laughs> I want to be in the Garden of Eden and experience you get a home that there. lovely area. Mm -hmm. What a privilege it'll be to actually have a conversation with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's made and this whole thing possible? With all the prophets and mm. and all the Old Testament people, and the angels who watched everything, just to meet and talk to all of them. Well, this poses another problem for our theistic evolution friends, or our evolutionary friends, for that matter. Which, of course, maybe they don't even think about this. But the theistic evolutionary friends, anyway, is God going to say, "Hold on, now, in the next million years, or two million years, or ten million years?" We're going we're gonna to watch it recreate itself. I'll start it, but we're going to watch for 10 million years while I guess the New Jerusalem will be floating on, a, on the lake of fire. I guess with eternity, to compare it with eternity, 10 million years wouldn't be all that big a deal. But I, I don't think I, it's going to happen that way. I think I'll be a little impatient after a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I have a very, I have a good friend and he is such a dedicated Christian, mm -hmm. Baptist, and better than I am. And he's a theistic evolutionist. And I you should have brought him over here, let him join our class. I really can't get him to talk through these things. He's a scientist and a mathematician, and he just can't get past the evidence that the human race is coming up with that it, for the, theistic evolution. Um, he just can't um, step outside um, the standard, you know, the human standard. And I keep saying, well, they might not have it right. I don't, you know, they don't have it right. And so anyway, it's, it's, um, well, but you can't fault his Christianity at all. Look at this. If, if we say God didn't create de novo back in the beginning, it took a long process, are we sure he can recreate a new heaven and a new earth? Maybe he won't be able to. Then where were we? We're in trouble, right? He did and <laughs> he will. He did and he will. Surely we don't believe any of the so-called evolutionary processes will be present in the new earth, do we? Are we going to evolve into something better than human? 
but I can see the plants in the Garden of Eden, <coughs> Eden evolving from a carnation and then go to sleep one night and come back a tulip the next day and I mean so there'll be that kind of changes. If, if that's what God wills. Uh -huh. that, that's one reason why the evolutionists can't buy into a flood because you'd have to have all of evolution start over and happen yeah. again. Yeah. Good point. And, and, if, and if there was not enough time in the history of the world to develop the eye, then certainly there's not enough time to do it all over after a flood. No. Well, and if you believe in the Darwinian evolutionary idea, the, all the details, when we, die, when we die there could be no resurrection because there would be no God. Now that's taking out the theistic part of the evolution. Well, if God is not going to come again and recreate our earth and our, our, our heaven and our earth, saving the righteous and eliminating sin and sinners, what was the point of his coming the first time? I mean, think about that. Is there any reason for Jesus having come the first time if, he has, if he's not able or, or can't or won't come back the next time and, 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 and save people who believe in him. You know, is God the creator or isn't he? Can he recreate us? Did he create earth? Can he recreate the earth? Mm -hmm. All this is questioning his create, creative status as being a creative God. Absolutely. Well, look at some of the verses. Look at Genesis 2, verse 2. And so the whole universe was completed, verse 1. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. I mean, I don't know how he could say it more plainly than that. And put, put alongside that, Genesis 3.19. You will have to work hard and sweat to make the soil produce anything until you go back to the soil from which you were formed. You are made from soil and you, are, you, you will become soil again. How many times have the atoms and molecules of Adam's body been reprocessed. And what have they been a part of? Bacteria, bugs, maybe other human beings. Maybe some of us have some of those original molecules, molecules that from Adam and Eve, even, even now. Well, the scriptures state very plainly that Adam, and for that matter, all the other creatures on the earth except Eve, Eve is the one exception, ladies, stand up and take a bow, were created from dirt. At least you were created from bone. A lot of ladies would agree with that, that <laughs> men were created from dirt. Yes. Well, the Bible says so. It's true. It's absolutely bone true. Was, bone was made from dirt, so. Yes. Well, some Hebrew scholars have suggested that the word should be clods or even clay instead of dust. But there was another part of the, to the lives of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that is perhaps even more important. We talked about this last week, but I'm going to mention it again here. They had daily access to the tree of life. They had that spark of life. What do we know about this tree of life? What's going what's to be like in the future? Are you saying that they were re-sparked every day? I, I, it almost seems like it, doesn't it? And so they probably had abilities far beyond what we have now who are not re-sparked every day. Mm -hmm. We sort of lose our spark as we get older, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> look, look at these kind of a fizzle. <laughs> look at these words from early writings, page 17. <clears throat> Here we see, and these were Ellen White in vision. She's traveling around, looking around heaven. Here we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. Out of the throne came a pure river of water, and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Now, elsewhere, we're told that the throne is floating on a, a lake, of, I mean, on a thing of fire, fire, aren't we? So there's a river and there's fire, I guess. On one side of the river was a trunk of a tree, and on the trunk on the, and, the, and a trunk on the other side of the river. At first, I thought I saw two trees, the trees of life, I guess. I looked again and saw that they were united at the top in one tree. So it was the, river, was the tree of life on either side of the river of life, and that's exactly what it says in Revelation 22. The, river of li the tree of life on either side of the river. Its branches bowed to the place where we stood, and the fruit was glorious. It looked like gold mixed with silver. Imagine that. She doesn't that. say what it tastes like, did she? No, she didn't get to bite any of it. <laughs> she didn't even get to do the Eve thing. <laughs> now, what's the significance of being on both sides of the river? 
I, I, I read, put that paragraph in there if I want, I want to ask you. What? Are you, and so there is a significance. Well, it's interesting to notice, you know, I have been, uh, I have seen in several places in the world trees that were big enough so that you could drive through. Mm -hmm. But I have never seen a river go through the middle of a tree. This is not a natural occurrence. So this isn't a creek. Well, over in, in Hawaii, they have a tree that's spread out and, and the, the uh, things uh, yeah. come down and they grow into, uh, into the ground. So maybe it could a be something. Tree. That, yeah, that's what I thought. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a little different mangrove. Yeah, yeah. mangroves. Yeah. That's a little different situation. Well, it's yeah. still, uh, do, they, do they root on the others? Yeah. And those things? Well, that, it's probably not all that far-fetched. So what's... So still, what's the significance of being on both sides of the it's stability? Huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge tree, and more than that, it's because it's huge. Well, Easy more than access that, to more both than sides. that, more than that. Let's think about this for a moment. If every righteous person who gets to heaven is supposed to eat from that tree every day, this is going to be a very prolific tree. They need a. A, a line on both sides. Yes. Well, maybe um, it would be like the uh, <laughs> bread and fish that Jesus broke into. Yes. Well, thousand to feed thousands. Is there any evidence that the first tree of life had a river running through it? No. No. Although, wasn't that tree in the center of the garden? garden? And didn't streams run through the center? Well, they so. come. The streams come from the somewhere in the yes. middle of the garden. But we don't know that it was running no. through the tree. Well, what we're seeing here is that heaven is going to be <clears throat> something beyond belief. We, we, we can't begin. We, even these simple little illustrations, we don't, we, we don't know how to describe them. Well, it's going to be more than us sitting on clouds, mm -hmm. uh, pulling the strings on a harp. Yeah. It's going to be real where we're going to work the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. We're going to build houses. We're going to talk and have potlucks together with good, healthy food. And so yeah. you're saying there won't be any harps? Well, there? no, I'm we're going to have harps. I'm but just, we're uh, going to spend all our time playing harps. Yeah. Okay, just a portion of the day. Okay. Yeah. Well, look at these words from Job. What do you think of these? Even after my skin is eaten by disease, while still in this body, I will see God. What do you think Job had in mind? Wow. Resurrection. Mm -hmm. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He, yeah. he didn't know whether he was going to live or die, but he didn't really, he was going he to said, trust anyhow. He said, God is by far my best friend. I'm not going to give up on him. Right. Well, God, Adam's body is no doubt deteriorated, and the individual atoms and molecules have been separated and recycled probably millions of times. But that's no problem for God. He can recreate Adam just as he was before. Surely it is clear that the resurrection is just as much an act of creation as was the original creation. You know, that gives people a lot of hope whose loved ones were um, gone in the sea, blown exactly. up by a war. God can bring that person back. Yes. Yeah. Well, look at what it says that adds to that in 1 Corinthians 15, starting with, I, let's start with 51. Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant. Does that sound like millions of years? If God can recreate us in an instant, what does that imply? Quickly as the blinking of an eye. As quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised never to die again, and we shall all be changed. And so you have your consciousness like you have now, mm -hmm. and, and it's in this body. Suddenly you have and a the, different body. And instantly you've got a whole new organism, organism with the same consciousness. Mm-hmm. What For what man. is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory? Where death is your power to hurt? Death gets its power to hurt from sin, and sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we will all be changed mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. at that last trumpet. And so there's a definite period of time when that happens, and that's at the last trumpet. Yes. And when, when are we told is the last trumpet? The resurrection. At the second coming. So it's a, it's a definitive time. It's a definite time that we can know. The blinking of an eye. Yeah. And what will happen to death? It's interesting that the Bible actually describes his death being thrown into the lake of fire. Look at uh, Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Whoever did not have their names written in the book, in the book of the living were thrown into the lake of fire. Have you ever heard of a scientific explanation of the resurrection? No. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if they're, they're going to come up with a new paradigm, we, we need a new, new paradigm for the resurrection, don't we? Well, Paul was asked about the resurrection. He called it a stupid question. Well, I mean, to explain it, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, if there is no resurrection, there's nothing beyond this life. Do people who believe in theistic evolution consider this, this, this detail? Well, look at Genesis 1, 28, and John 12. Blessed them, blessed them, and God made them male and female, blessed them and said, have many children so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting you in charge of the fish, the birds, and all the wild animals. That was God's original plan. And compare this. So Adam, who was in charge of the whole world? Who was supposed to be in charge of the whole world? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Look at John 12, verse 31. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. Is that Adam? Nope. Who is that? Satan. That's Satan. Okay. Adam gave up his dominion. <coughs> mm -hmm. Adam gave our world to Satan. Yeah. What a sad story. Adam was created to be the head of this world's family. He was a direct son of God. Where would you find that information? In the Bible. Luke 3.38, the end of chapter 3, it says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And what's, the, what's supposed to be the role of the sons of God? They're supposed you remember Job 1? Look at Job 1 in verse um, 6. When the day came for the heavenly beings, and if you look at that, it actually says what? Sons of God. The sons of God to appear before the Lord. Satan was there among them. So who should have been there among them? Adam. Should have been Adam as the head of our race, right? Notice it's all sons of God. It's not daughters of God. Well, I, I think that just reflects the culture of the times. In Deuteronomy 32, 9, excuse me, 32, 8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he fixed the bounds of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Christians know that Jesus came and lived and died to defeat Satan and take away his claim to this earth. And there's lots of verses for that. Take a couple of Matthew 28, 18. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have give, been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Who now has all the authority? Jesus. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority for the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Who is that talking about? Satan. Satan. So only Jesus could throw Satan out of leadership of our world. We cannot. And how did he do that? That's the, the critical question. By presenting evidence that mm -hmm. Satan was a rebel and uh, his And that he's been, lied, he's been lying to us from the beginning. He should not be trusted. Christ's victory on the cross guarantees us that truth and righteousness will finally be victorious over sin and death. Think about that. 
More than that, the righteous will judge with God in heaven. 2 Timothy 11 and, well, let's look at that. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. I don't want you to just believe things here because I happen to be saying them. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 11. This is a true saying. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we continue to endure, we shall also rule with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are not faithful, he remains faithful because he cannot be false to himself. And try Revelation 5, verse 10. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on earth. Are God's people rulers on the earth right now? No. And look at Revelation 4. I'm sorry, Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed, because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed in the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. And it goes on, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead. Happy and greatly blessed are those uh, who are included in this first raising of the dead. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for how long? A thousand years. That's just the heavenly part of the story. But the righteous will certainly not spend all their time sitting on thrones judging the wicked. And so I bring you another passage from Great Controversy, page 677. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flights, flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe, and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. Luke 15 tells us that all heaven rejoices more over one sinner that repents than over 99 just people who don't need any repentances. Any repentance. You know, when we get resurrected, mm -hmm. are we going to know upon first awakening, are we going to have to ask, is this the first resurrection or is this the second? Would you please tell me? <laughs> we'll know. <laughs> we'll know. We'll look up and see Jesus coming and we'll say, this is the first one. <laughs> yeah. Well, with unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. Great Controversy 677. Have you ever thought about what it's going to be like to have a conversation with your guardian angel? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scary, huh? Boy, was I a little stinker down there. <laughs> <laughs> the apologizing. Mm. We spend the rest of our life, rest of eternity apologizing? No, uh, rest of eternity thanking him. Mm -hmm. What will be the result of our having open and free communion with angels and even God himself? More learning, more uh, or closer relationship with the I, Lord. I imagine it's something like this, and you, this is my imaginations. You can do what you like with it. <laughs> but I imagine that on Sabbath, we'll meet together with God, and we'll say, man, you know what I did this last week? I discovered this and this. I saw that and that and that. And God will be standing there smiling, and he'll say, that's great. I have a suggestion for you. Next week, why don't you try this and this and this and this and see what happens. What I'm curious about, there's going to be many people in heaven. Mm -hmm. How is God going to sit down with each one of us on Sabbath and talk to us? Are we going to wait in a line like the Santa Claus yes. line how, at Christmas? How, how can he be everywhere at one time? So we'll be presented with a being that is talking to all of us at the same time. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Pretty hard to get our heads around yes, what divinity can do in heaven. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, he <laughs> listens... Everybody pray, prays around the world, and he listens to all the prayers yeah. at the same time. So, Well, we kind of talk like we're going to see the president every day. Yeah. You know, we, don't, we don't see the president every day. Everybody can understand why. But we talk like we, we're going to be able to talk to Jesus anytime we want to. So there's got to be something more there than just the physical. Yeah, like we're in heaven, not down here. Heaven. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, but <laughs> in the world as we know it, predation and the food chain, as we describe it, are an essential part of the balance of nature. You can, you can study big populations of animals, like, for example, on the Serengeti, and 
there'll be waves. Sometimes there's more lions and fewer water buck and, uh, and, and all kinds of antelopes and so forth, or, or, or even the brindled blue, as we call them, the, the wildebeest. And then maybe there'll be a time when there'll be fewer lions and there'll be more wildebeest. And, you know, there's a balance there. So we know about this, but clearly this was not the case in the Garden of Eden. Nothing was to die there. What are the implications of nothing ever dying? Will we be allowed to pick flowers and put them in our homes? And if we decide to change the scenery sometime later, what happens to the old flowers? Put it back on the tree. Put it back on the tree or somewhere else, plant it somewhere else? I don't know. Uh -huh. <laughs> the flower exchange. Yeah, right. <laughs> the flower exchange. <laughs> would, it, would it decay in space? Well, are, are you saying if I took a flower out in space right now and, yeah, it would decay. Yeah, it would, it would freeze solid. Well, you know, one thing you know, just from looking at this earth, God is not a boring person. No. And, I mean, he gives you flower after flower to look at, animal after animal, rock and grasses. So, uh, in heaven, it's got to be, it will not be a boring place at all. Wing your flights to worlds afar. Yeah. Well, be a whole lot more than just looking around here. There's, there's some things that will have to change. Someone calculated the, the, the reproductive capacity of flies. And they determined that if you start out with one pair of flies in April, and if all their offspring survive and have enough food to eat and, and, and reproduce again, and all their offspring are survive and on and on like this, by the end of six months, so until about the fall season, of October more or less, the world would be covered by flies 49 feet thick. How oh, wonderful. <laughs> so that sounds like a plague, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So something's going to have to give, right? Birth mm -hmm. control. <laughs> Birth control. A lot Frog. of ice water. Probably procreation. Yeah. Well, Ellen White speaks about three curses that affect our, affected our Earth in the early days. The curse that resulted from the sins of Adam and Eve, the curse that resulted from Cain's killing Abel, and the curse that brought on the flood. What do we know about the earth and its inhabitants before the flood? There was no rain. The garden was uh, watered by mm -hmm. water uh, misting up from each morning. Okay, look, look at Genesis 6, and I'm going to start reading from verse 9. This is the story of Noah. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had no faults and was the only good man of his time. He lived in fellowship with God, but everyone else was evil in God's sight, and violence had spread everywhere. God looked at the world and saw that it was evil, for the people were all living evil lives. Okay? How did Noah happen to stay good and connected to God during those times? And how much longer would they have survived? Would he, would the, their, Noah's descendants have survived if, if God hadn't been there to do something? I think one more generation and righteousness would have disappeared completely. I mean, to say Noah had no faults, that's really saying something in an evil world. Yeah. So the flood was to rescue the human race from destruction. Yes, exactly. From separation from God. Total separation from God. Well, look at the results after the flood, just as Genesis uh, 9, starting with verse 2, all the animals, birds, and fish will live in fear of you. They are all placed under your power. Now, before, they were all friendly. There was no problem. Now the animals are afraid of us. And I can, I can you know, people talk to me about running out on the hills behind Loma Linda because there are quite a number of wild animals out there. I've seen bobcats. I've seen lots and lots and lots of coyotes. I've seen all kinds of wild animals, even deer and, and, and big male buck deer. Um, and I've been told that there are people who've seen mountain lions out there. But what's the, what, what happens when I, I, I've seen five or six coyotes, probably at the, at the maximum number I've seen at one time. And what do they do when you come running up to them? They kind of leave. They run. They run. In Africa, I had the privilege of walking with a game ranger one time. He said, he said to us, two or three of us in this vehicle, he says, Let's, and this was in a game park where it was closed down because it was heavy rains and so forth. And he says, what do you think those lions will do? They were on a fresh kill. You, three young lions on a fresh kill. He says, what do you think they'll do if we walk over there? 
And I said, well, let's try it and see. Oh, no. Of course, he had a gun, but we had our cameras. And I have pictures of it. We walked over there, and we got up about 30 feet from them, and they ran. They left their fresh kill and ran away. Hmm. They saw the gun. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they knew a gun from something else. They saw human beings. They said, we don't like what we're seeing. Now, didn't Ellen White speak about this curse of the animals running away from us? Because yeah. it started out that, that uh, Noah and his family were scared that they were going to turn on them. Yeah. So um, it looks like, w what was the change? Was it for the good or for the bad? <laughs> well, here, let me read the rest of the verses here. They are all placed under your power, these animals, but they're going to run away from you. Now you can eat them as well as green plants. I gave them all to you for food. The one thing you must not eat is meat with blood still in it. I forbid this because the life is in the blood. Now, technically, from a pathological point of view, Norm, you're into that kind of stuff, the life is not in the blood. That's just a symbol. Why did they believe the life was in the blood? Well, if you saw too much of it, it died. Yeah. What, if, they, if they had to have, offer an animal sacrifice, the first thing they would see is the blood coming out, and after a while, the animal's dead. So it seemed like the life was in the blood, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, having said that, why, does, why did God forbid them to eat food with the or animals, flesh, with the blood still in it? Well, I have my reason. Okay. Because the blood was the highest um, commitment that you can give to somebody when you make a promise. I see. A that, when promise. You, that when you tell somebody that if I don't do this, you can kill me, there's nothing else more that you can do than that. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that the blood was held sacred because of that. Okay. Well, you know, today you have to be very careful that you don't handle blood. And I think a lot of disease is in blood. Well, what is in the blood? Waste products. Waste. A lot of waste, waste products. Product. You know what gives meat its flavor? The waste products. The waste products. The waste products. For those of you who may have a question about that, here's a, here's a little experiment you can try. Take a, like a one-inch cube of your favorite steak, if you like steak, and boil it for a little while, then squeeze all the juice out of it and boil a little bit longer, squeeze the juice out, and, and see what it tastes like if you have just the protein. Rubber? Can you guess? Rubber. A little bit like rubber. So, no flavor at all. So what are you saying? I'm saying the reason God told them to get the blood out was so that they wouldn't develop such an appetite for it. Oh. They wouldn't get an appetite for the meat for that the had meat, the blood. For the blood. So he made it. I better. still like mine better. Uh -huh. your, your idea? Yeah, I still so God, like mine better. I'm sorry. <laughs> God made it as What is it you like better? <laughs> well, you know, um, there was a whole thing about Abraham, you know, uh -huh. and the promise that God did, you know, during the first... Mm -hmm. um, you know, where he had them sacrifice the, or take the animals and cut them in half, and then him walking through it. It was an ancient That custom. would, that, there was a lot of blood there, yeah. and there was a lot of commitment made there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oh, yeah. so, and so this is what I think is, is the primo number one reason why blood is sacred, is, okay. is its commitments. That's fine. Um, it's also As true. far as, as far as eating? Well, this verse is talking about eating it. It's not talking about making commitments. So, In what way? Is it well, Genesis 9. It just says here, look at verse 4. The one thing you must not eat is meat with blood still in it. And I forbid this because the life is in the blood. And I'm just saying that the reason why you don't eat it is because of that more than anything. That's, well, that's how I kind of look at it. Okay. Yeah, I may be wrong. I don't know, but that's well, how I it's see clear, it looking it's over clear the whole The same eat. requirement of beasts. Uh, animals eat the blood, and mm -hmm. there's a consequence of them eating the blood. Mm -hmm. According to going to Genesis, or they're on Genesis 4. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's clear that um, 
that places like McDonald's, um, they thrive on the blood. Well, people had become incredibly wicked. After the flood, human beings were allowed to eat meat, however, with the blood as far as possible removed. Did this have something to do with the very rapid decline in the length of human lives? We know what happened. Animals were afraid of human beings, and we assume that man's dominion over the animals was considerably diminished. But that will not be the case in the new earth. And of course, you know places like Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65 that talk about the lion lying down with the lamb and the leopard with the goat and with the kid and, and, and little babies playing close to the snakes. What does that imply? Don't did any of you, did any of you, when you were a small child, hear these stories and think about the time you'd be able to put your arm around a great big lion with his mane? I think that's one of the favorite pictures of little kids. Yeah. And, and that lion's mane is in tiger's hair and whatnot. It's very rough. Mm -hmm. It's not soft like people think. Yeah. When I was a kid up in the Northwest, there was a, a people that had a, a pet lion. And you could go in and play with it till it got big. Till it got big, and then they decided they wouldn't let people go in there anymore. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> but you could go play with the lion. That was kind of yeah. Well, I in don't Africa, think girls have any desire to go and touch a lion. I don't know it. In Africa, uh, we live. True. No, that's not true. No. Sorry. Oh, I would okay. love to. You would love to. Oh yeah. Oh. When we lived in a the place we lived in Africa, there was a there was a private little private zoo kind of place right next to us, a family that had a number of animals, and we saw cheetahs and we saw we didn't she didn't have any lions but we I I've, I've touched and petted cheetahs and and they had uh, oslets, um little tiny no uh, not oslets, uh, serval serval cats and so forth and they had little tiny serval cats were so cute. So now here's cute. a question. Do you think our pets, our precious pets that we've loved for many years and pass away are going to be in heaven? You know, I've heard uh, lots of arguments back and forth about that, and I think I'm going to leave that up to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He's certainly capable of doing that, and if that's what he chooses to do, it'll be wonderful. As one of the animals, it could be your dog or cat mm -hmm. that you had down here. Mm -hmm. Well. As we know, before the entrance of sin, Adam enjoyed open communion with his maker. That's Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 7. When sin entered our world, drastic changes took place in this arrangement. And what are those drastic changes? Look at this. In Genesis 3.24, then at the east side of the garden, he put, a li he put living creatures in a flaming sword which turned in all directions. This was to keep anyone from coming near the tree that gives life. So then we were separated from the tree of life. And what was the result? Exodus 33, verse 20, I will not let you see my face. This is God speaking to his best friend Moses. I will not let you see my face because no one can see my face and stay alive. And what's, how are things going to be on into the future? We'll look at Deuteronomy 5, 24, and, and said, The Lord our God showed us his greatness and his glory when he when we heard him speak from the fire. Today we have seen that it is possible for a human being to, to continue to live even though God has spoken to him. But why should we risk death again? That terrible fire will destroy us. We are sure to die if we hear the Lord our God speak again. Has any human being ever lived after hearing the living God speak from fire? So what's happened from those wonderful times when we had free access and communion with God? Well, Desire of Ages, page 107, paragraph 4, and I hope you'll excuse me from borrowing a great deal from Ellen White. She says, At the second coming we're told that the light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. Why is that? The same glory gives life to one group and kills the other group. Where is the difference? Is the difference in God's glory? No. It's what's inside us. If we do not have Jesus inside us, the glory will annihilate, will vaporize us. If we have Jesus inside us, we will feel the warmth and the love. 
we, we understand vaguely some of that. The same sun melts butter and hardens the clay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but you know, y you as a pathologist probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference if one of the saints died and one of the, the evil people sinners died and you, you did an autopsy, you probably wouldn't be able to, to, to sell, to tell the difference. Why? What's happened? What happens there? Is it, is, it, is, it physio is it something that happens in the brain that causes a chemical reaction in the body? Don't know. We just don't know. Well, we know in John 14, 1 to 3, it tells us that wh where has Jesus gone? To prepare, to prepare a place, a place for us, right? And then the marvelous words in Revelation 22, 3 to 5, nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will worship Him. They will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. They will see his face. There shall be no more night, and they will not need lamps or sunlight, because the Lord God will be their light, and they will rule as kings forever and ever. What does I, it mean that God's name will be in our forehead? That's not a tattoo. No. That means that we are, we are experiencing intelligent <laughs> obedience and worship. And our point. intelligence then is in our forehead. Yes. Yeah. Well, one thing I hope that God doesn't take away with this all 24-hour light is I hope, I hope once in a while we get to see a sunset or a sunrise. About three or four days ago, I was up early studying. I'm up early every morning, but I happened to look outside the window. There was a most gorgeous sunrise you can possibly imagine. It was so, I mean, every shade from purple to orange to to yellow, to oh, it was gorgeous. Anyway, the great news for the righteous is that God has gone to prepare places for us. Once again, we'll be able to hold direct communion with Him and see Him face to face. Finally, God's original plan for the human race will be fulfilled. And these are Ellen White's words to describe that. And the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer, and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. So what's going to be the, the best part of heaven? Knowing more about Richer God. Richer and more glorious revelations of God and of, of Christ. As knowledge of, is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be the admiration of His character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements, in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransomed will thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy they, uh, they sweep the harps of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. Now once in a while we get huge choirs. I mean, I've heard choirs up to like 200 people and they are just incredible. Imagine a, a million voice choir. Can you imagine it? In, in harmony. Perfect harmony. Not just maybe four part, maybe 24 part, you know. Then he's going to give us a singing voice. Yes. Well, the he's great controversy. to do on me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. And for that matter, death is gone. Any disease is gone. All that stuff is gone. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Great Controversy 678. You recognize the last paragraph of that book. As we look at some of the verses in the Bible describing our future home, is it really possible even for us to imagine what it will be like? We can't even imagine what the Garden of Eden was like. Paul and the other apostles suffered a lot in their lives here on this earth, but they looked forward to a life when they, uh, that they believe would be so glorious that the trials and troubles of this earth would not even come to mind. Just take a look at that real quick. Romans 8, 18. I consider what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all 
with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. What did Paul think? Wow. And 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. For this reason, we never become discouraged, even though our physical being is gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. And this small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory with much greater than the trouble. Is that I mean, Paul? That's Paul. Because he had no small and temporary trouble. No. He had large and ongoing trouble. Yes. So I ask the question again, can we even picture, can we even imagine what the new earth will be like? Our minds can only imagine things with which we are somewhat familiar. We use ideas and mental pictures that are stored in memory to try to put together, imagine what things will be like in the future. But the truth is that we have never seen anything even close to the glorious new earth, which will be our future home. For this reason, primarily, it is very difficult for us now to picture in our minds what it will be like. Do you think we will have computers? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't think we'll need I mean, computers. Can, Biologic computers. Yeah. yeah. Can we do without our computers and phones? And hmm. Well, Christians have repeatedly said in the past that if we want to live in heaven, heaven must live in us now. What does that imply? We have to get a piece of heaven in us now or we won't make it to heaven. So how do you do that? Yeah. I ran on to an interesting statement that said that we are so to have Jesus so focused in us that it was it was compared to looking at the meridian sun in its glory with your eyes then looking away and you have those sunspots that are in front of everything that you look at. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We're supposed to see Jesus in front of everything that we look at and everything that we do. I thought that was really that was very, very interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. Not good for your retinas, so. No. But sure is good for eternal life. <laughs> it's a good illustration, I would say. Will we be afraid of God in any way? Would you feel comfortable going up to God and giving him a big hug? Will we feel apprehensive about our sins and guilty, or will all that be taken away? I think all that's going to be gone. We're going to be so excited about everything that's there. We're, God will say, if anyone ever should say to us, remember what it was like, and we might say, no, I, I really don't remember. I, I, that's, I don't even care about that anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, try to imagine what it would be like to meet with God at least every Sabbath and to discuss what we have learned and discovered in the previous week and have him suggest some exciting new discoveries for the following week? Will we be able to see with our own eyes into the subatomic world and watch atoms and molecules in their activity? Will we be able not only to see but to travel to the most distant portions of the universe? When we suggest that God will destroy the heavens and the earth and make them new, does that involve only our solar system? We don't know. I have a question. Yeah. A lot of times there's mysteries in our lives. We just don't know what happened. When we get to heaven, will we be able to go into the book of life and read about the account, what happened, and understand what happened here on earth? I think anything like that that we have questions about that are really important, God will reveal to us. Yeah. Besides that, you'll, have, you'll be able to interview a lot of people around you that saw things you, you didn't see. And Okay. By the way, if you uh, are interested in our discussions and the things we talk about here, we prepare handouts that we, we use as sort of a general guide to follow as we study these lessons. And those handouts are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. And you can get the handouts for just this lesson itself, for example. Well, heaven will be a place where everyone is loving and kind and always looking out for others. Selfishness will be totally alien, totally alien to that environment. And what would happen if Satan, if sinners were allowed to enter heaven? I thought, I thought this was a very significant passage. Satan sees, now this is 
as the New Jerusalem is coming down at the third coming, Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. He would be looking for a way to mess things up. Maybe that is the torture right there. Yeah. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. Great Conifers 670, paragraph 2. And of course, that's a reflection of Philippians 2, 10 and 11, Isaiah 45, 23, Romans 14, 11, I think it is. Satan is allowed 1,000 years on this earth between the second and third comings to begin to realize what his rebellion has cost him and others. Revelation 21, 1 to 5 that we read earlier gives us two links back to the creation story in the Garden of Eden. There's the serpent, and there's a world in total destruction without form and void. And you remember what it says in Genesis 1, 2? The earth was formless and desolate. The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the waters. I traveled with some friends uh, a couple of years ago down to visit Patagonia, clear down the southern tip of South America. Now, that's the closest piece of continent that reaches toward the Antarctic, short of, I mean, the next stop is Antarctica. And for that reason, there's nothing in the way of wind whipping all the way around the earth. And every morning you get up in a beautiful, calm, quiet, beautiful sunrise and so forth. But later on in the day, the wind would come up. And if you walked along the, the shore of a lake, it would just whip so much water off of, off, right out of the lake, just whoosh, whipping it right out of the lake. It was like standing in a rainstorm. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you could see, I took movies of the, uh, and stills as well, of, of the water blowing up off, the, off of the lake. The, the, the water was so severe. Well, we, but we hope that during these lessons, when we have studied creation and it's all its implications and thought about what it implies for our future, our resurrection, the making of new selves and so forth like this, we hope you found that all very enlightening and that you will think about it as you meet with your class and study with your Sabbath school lesson. Hope we'll, hope we'll see you next week.